we're on. Okay, well, good evening. Welcome to Bethel Bible Chapel and our Wednesday evening Bible study series. Your questions, your topics. I want to thank you for all coming out on this cold winter evening. And uh, I'd like to open in prayer. We just learned that Janet Teets was not feeling well after supper, so we'll pray for her. And I think Krista's in a plane somewhere over the Pacific about this time. So uh, let's open in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks this evening, first of all, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who uh, in your plan fulfilled your perfect will so that he might die as our representative and our substitute, bearing the penalty for our disobedience and sin towards you, and that all who have put their faith in him now have the assurance that they have eternal life through him. So we give you thanks for the mercy and grace that comes to us through the Lord Jesus. We would pray for the needs of the assembly. We think of Janet Teets and her illness and pray your healing hand would be on her. We would pray for Krista Besselman as she's flying home from uh, Papua New Guinea. And we pray that you'd give her a safe uh, trip, you, that you would be watching over her and give her some uh, peaceful rest uh, on the plane and keep her mind alert for all her, her needs and the, uh, the transfers and and connections. We would also pray for the medical needs of Esther Teets, for Louis Boyer, and uh, also for Dave Piper. So we would uh, commit them all to you, knowing that they are in your capable hands and that you love them to the utmost. So we would commit this following hour. We pray the Holy Spirit would uh, work in our hearts and minds that we might consider things out of your word. And so we would commit this to you in uh, our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Well, since the beginning of the year, we've been undertaking a Wednesday study of your questions and your topics. And when we started out with this, I asked uh, my family, do you have any questions on our topics? And my oldest daughter said, yes. Should Christians recycle? And so I said, okay, well, I've had a career in the environmental field. I might take that on, and we'll, we'll see what comes out of that. Um, and I know that... Um, purpose of the study is to look into scripture and find out what scripture tells us uh, about these various questions and topics. And uh, so that's the first thing, but in doing the study we also look at uh, what other people have commented in the past and uh, we'll even bring Calvin into the, the message this evening, what he says. And I want to thank the school children for coming out. I'd like you to place Pay close attention because I'm going to have some questions specifically for you. There won't be a quiz, but uh, try and pay attention. So thanks for coming. Um, and I know you're accustomed to, uh, at this podium, having speakers that are uh, good, in-depth Bible teachers and seasoned speakers. But we're going to take a break from that tonight. <laughs> and the only apology I can offer is that, hey, it's me. So the question that was raised was, should a Christian recycle? And I like those types of questions, and it's just a nice direct question. It uh, begs a simple one-word answer. But then as I got to thinking about it, I can't really answer that and be able to explain why Scripture would support a, a, a yes or no answer to a question like that. So I decided to take a look at it in a little broader sense to develop some kind of a principle or guidelines that Scripture may have that would help us make a decision on a question like this. And so I came up with Christians in the Environment, which is very broad and vague, but we'll see what we can do with this. But the ultimate question that I'd like to answer is, should a Christian recycle? And we're talking about waste materials like paper and glass. <coughs> and uh, things that we would normally throw in a landfill in our trash. Now, as far as the environment goes, everyone reacts or interacts with the environment in some way. I mean, we all breathe the air. We all drink water. We have clothes that are made from various types of fabrics and so forth now that are made different ways. But, and we get our food from um, the ground and the sea and so forth. We all have those basic interactions with the environment. But someone who grows up in, let's say, southwest Pennsylvania, like we are here, 
is going to react a little differently to their environment than someone from, say, uh, Midwest and South Dakota, where we have friends, or someone who just lives in a penthouse in Manhattan is going to react differently than us, or someone like Krista who's in the, the highlands of Papua New Guinea. There's different uh, needs or um, different ways that people have to or do interact or choose to interact. And so <coughs> individuals all have that interaction with the environment, something we have in common. But it's often that since we don't react or interact in the same way, that uh, even in given families, the same family, people are going to interact differently. And I'd like to show you what Calvin has to say about this. <laughs> okay, you're familiar with Bill Watterson's Calvin and Hobbes comic strip. And uh, I'm going to rely on Calvin for a few comments through the, the talk. But if you can't even agree on what temperature to set the thermostat at, how are you going to deal as a society with uh, some of these bigger problems that we have to deal with in the environment? Environment's in the news almost all the time, and you don't have to look hard, and you can just sort of pick and choose what uh, the topic is that you want to look at. But uh, climate change and, you know, the various countries are trying to deal with uh, greenhouse gas emissions and so forth. So if we can't figure out how to approach things or we approach things differently as individuals, how is society going to deal with some of these major problems that affect a lot of people and in very serious ways? And so the first question I have for our school students is, can you identify this celebrity? Smokey? Smokey? What's the rest of his name? Smokey? Yeah, <laughs> that is Smokey the Bear, and he was introduced in the 1940s by the United States Forest Service as their spokesperson, you might say, or mascot for a program that's represented in the slogan underneath that's incomplete. Can you finish that slogan? Is it only you? Uh, no. Okay, how about one of our older students? Only you. Right, they've updated him. But uh, you know, forest fires were a significant problem uh, many years ago because people who would go out with campfires or with cigarettes or something wouldn't leave them controlled or doused. And uh, you know, large areas, particularly in the West, would just burn to the ground. And the devastation was tremendous. There was a big economic loss of timber. Wildlife died and even human lives were lost. And uh, so this was their program to try and alert people to the need to be interested in your own safety, but to prevent forest fires, save our forest. Okay, now here's a question for anyone. Can you describe what this picture is of? A it's a forest, right? Anything more specific? It's like very green. Very green, yes, that's from chlorophyll. <laughs> But this is a longleaf pine. They call them plantations down south. The whole southeast United States used to be covered with uh, trees and uh, habitat like this. <laughs> and you can see how open it is underneath. These trees are very tall. They don't have any lower limbs. And uh, what we call the canopy is uh, uh, far above the ground. And you can see a little tree growing there. The longleaf pine has a very interesting life history. When the pine cones shed their seeds, the seeds have to germinate in bare ground. So if the ground is uh, covered in grasses or uh, other undergrowth, the seeds won't germinate. So it's important that the ground be bare. And so when the seeds germinate, they produce a little tuft, as you can see there, a tuft which looks just like a bunch of grass. And it'll stay that way for three or four years. It looks like it's not doing anything. But then what it's doing is putting down a root system and developing energy. So around the fourth year or so, it all of a sudden jumps up about four feet and high. And then it continues to grow straight. And uh, these trees were very valuable for construction and lumber. 
for shipbuilding back in the early days of our country. So that most of these forests were logged, and now they're trying to bring that back. And um, what they have found is that the way these forests maintain themselves is through forest fires. Basically, the ground fire you see here, lightning strikes or something naturally will set off the underbrush, and it'll burn off the understory. But you remember those little mounds, those what we call the baby trees, start those fires and we make sure that the grounds burn off. So now we're starting fires to manage things. What do you think Smokey would say about that? Okay, but it's two different things in a sense. We manage it differently because resources are slightly different. So the one thing doesn't work everywhere. Now what is this a picture of? Another forest. It's another forest. Yeah, this is a redwood forest that we find out on the, the west coast of this country. And some of these trees are a thousand years old or more. And when I was in college, the big environmental issue was save the redwoods, save the redwood trees, because they were being logged. And so all the college students would go out and protest. And uh, you know these trees are huge; they provide excellent construction lumber. But once they're gone and clear cut, you know, that forest, that thousand-year-old forest, won't grow back in our generation, and generally something different comes along. And the practices they had of clear-cutting meant that this area would be void of vegetation, it would be very susceptible to erosion, and that washes off, it gives water pollution and so forth. It changes the whole forest. And if you clear-cut everything, eventually all the redwoods would be gone. So we wanted to save the redwoods without having to deal with clear-cutting. So clear-cutting is a bad thing. Now, Benji, I know you're studying birds, so this question is specifically for you. Can you identify that bird? Have you learned what that is yet? It's in Pennsylvania, but we don't have them around here so much. Okay. That's okay. No, it isn't. Look at the long beak on there. The fresh would have a smaller beak. Not a hummingbird, no. This is an American woodcock. Philohella minor is the scientific name. And if you ever want to get extra credit, you can impress somebody by saying it's also known as a timber doodle. That's a little easier to say than Philohella minor, I think. But the American woodcock is an important bird for hunters. And although it's not too common in Pennsylvania, it's much more common in the Northeast U.S. And my best friend in college uh, went on to get a, a graduate degree in wildlife management from WVU and got a job with a uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at a place called Moosehorn National Wildlife Refuge up in Maine. It's very close to Canada along the coast. And he's uh, one of the birds he was managing for at this refuge was the American woodcock. And uh, so he was up there trying to find out what we can do, what can we do to manage these lands so this bird will increase in numbers. And after a couple of years, he gave me a call. He said, Connor, guess what I'm doing? said, we're clear cutting. So what's bad out in the other forest is good for certain things, but if it's done in a small way. So going in, um, making decisions on how to manage things varies on what type of resource you're managing and how you go about it, what your goals are. One more example close to home, Presque Isle State Park up in Erie. Okay, you see that it's a, um, it's a large sandbar. Has everybody been there? All been there? Not been to the beaches there? Well, it's a big recreation resource because of the sandy beaches. And uh, my family home is right about there. But this is a, uh, basically a large sandbar that goes back to uh, 
time when the glacial uh, glaciers receded, and you have a uh, sandy beach, and the winds and the currents which come from the west hit this um, here. They erode the sands, and the sands are swept around and they are deposited on the far side. And so you can see in the past, what you have is some dunes and swales. The lower areas um, have the, the lighter green. The higher areas have trees that eventually grow in. But in this area where the sandbar and disposition is fairly new, you have open sandy beaches. And that's very important for actually an endangered um, shorebird called the piping plover. That's prime nesting habitat for them. Well. People don't like sand eroding because it leaves behind the gravel. People like nice sandy, uh, soft sand, fine sand beaches. And when I was a child, they would dredge sand from uh, further out in the lake and pump it up on the beach. And they had to do that. It's costly. So they uh, went to the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and said, what can we do to stabilize these beaches? And they came up with a plan to build rock dikes called breakwaters and place them outside so that the waves and the currents are broken up and the sand transport now is um, minimized. But the problem with that is it created another issue in that all that sand that used to go around to the far end is not getting there anymore and it's going to grow up and be vegetated and they won't have the open sandy beaches for the piping plover or other species. You, you lose that diversity. And so now they're actually thinking of dredging sand deposited out there for habitat. And they're trying to figure out how to do that. So, uh, you know, you create, uh, you create a solution to one problem and you may create problems in another area. But how do we manage things? How do we respond to our environment to try and manage it the best way? And with all these conflicting goals, we have um, very difficult times in determining what the correction, correct action is. But getting back to our study question, you know, should Christians recycle our waste materials? Um, how are we going to take a look at this? And in the scripture, you know, of course, our study focuses on God's word, not pre people's opinions or what you read in the newspaper or even experience. What does God's word say about how we relate or how we should manage our environment? And uh, so. For a Bible study, the first thing you do is you go to your concordance and you look up the key words like environment and recycle, and you should have your answer. <laughs> well, I did that, and I didn't find it was in the, the concordance at all. So I thought, where do you go from there? Um, well, if you're starting to study about the environment, which we would also call God's creation, the best place to start would be at the beginning. So we're going to take a look at Scripture now. and. Uh, Instead of opening our Bibles, I don't like to put a lot of text up here, but we'll just take a look and read it off the screen. So bear with me on that. So in the beginning, God created the heaven, or heavens, can be translated singular or plural, and the earth. And then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule or have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule, or have dominion, over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Okay, well, that's the statement of the creative act of the Lord there in Genesis. And we're going to look at certain key words and uh, look at them a little closer. First of all, he said, let us make them, let us make man or let them rule. So even before he made man and then later uh, the woman out of man, he refers to them as them. So it was already in his mind before they were made that there would be male and female. And he refers to them as them. So ladies, in this discussion, you're just as much as part of the the discussion as we are. It's not just a man thing. Then the next word I'd like to point out is dominion or rule. He said, let them rule or have dominion over all the earth and over the animals. 
And then further down, subdue, subdue it. And again, rule or have dominion. So let's take a look at these words and find out what they actually mean. The word translated dominion from the Hebrew means to tread down, to subjugate, to have dominion, prevail against, reign, rule, bear, or make rule. And a couple other scriptures where this word is the same Hebrew word translated dominion. First one refers to uh, a prophecy of the Lord Jesus who will come out of Jacob and shall have dominion and destroy him, the remnant, that is, of his enemies from the city. So if you're going to destroy your enemies, you've got some conflict there, don't you? And you need some power to overcome your enemies. So dominion has that aspect to it. And he, referring to the king of Israel, shall have dominion also from sea to sea. So there's a realm or a, uh, a space where you have your dominion. So from here we look at dominion as meaning, at least in part, superiority in having authority. You are the supreme authority. You also have power to uh, be victory, victorious in conflict. And it covers a sphere of influence. That is dominion. But dominion is also translated rule. Same word, translated rule. So how is it used in that case? In the scripture where they were describing building the temple, they talk about Solomon's offer officers which were over the work. There were 3,300 officers which ruled over the people that wrought in the work. So all these, actually there were tens of thousands of men cutting stone and cutting timbers to make the temple and all the other buildings. So they had a lot of people who were what we would call managers or supervisors. And so that's one aspect of rule, uh, managing a workforce, overseeing a project. Then also in the, the Psalm 110, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. So again, rule means having authority and the power of authority to defeat your enemies. So there's some conflict involved. And in your authority, you uh, are supreme in power to rule over them. So both rule and dominion refer to power and authority, but it can be exercised differently depending on what you're ruling over. If you're managing a workforce, you would rule over them differently than you would a military enemy. So it's not a, uh, a simple term in that aspect, but then we also wanted to look at subdue. He said, have dominion and then also subdue the earth. Now this means to tread down, to conquer, to bring into bondage, force, keep, bring, uh, keep under, or bring into subjection. And a couple of cases where it is translated subdued, uh, Moses referring to uh, two tribes of um, Gad and Rumen, they were armed for battle, they were going to cross over the Jordan, and the land shall be subdued before you. So they're ready to go to battle. There was conflict there. And then King David below also dedicated silver and gold from all the nations which he had subdued. So again, conflict, military conquest, uh, even more strongly than dominion. Subdue means that you actually have something that you have to overcome. So it means to bring into subjection and also to keep under subjection. So when God gave man um, the authority or the, the command to have dominion and to subdue, he had some idea that there was conflict involved or that there would be some work involved. But then we read further in the creation account, and the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he took man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now the word dress has the idea of laboring or tilling, as you would a garden. And keep means to guard or watch over. So this raised a couple of questions in my mind. What in creation did Adam have to guard against? And also, what conflict did Adam have to deal with? If you're like me, I always thought creation was like one big petting zoo. 
where everything, and they're all vegans too, so you know, there was, what, what conflict did you possibly have? Unless some of the animals were getting into your garden, uh, which could be it. But I read some speculative things on this, and I'm not going to get into that. But here's a couple questions you might want to think about, and we might be able to address later, but I'm not sure the scripture really has a, a good answer to that. But dominion he had to dress, keep, and guard and watch over. Now, another question that came to mind, okay, in granting mankind dominion, did God also give man ownership of the earth? And there is a psalm that says, the heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. To me, that might sound like he has given us ownership, not only the, uh, to rule or have dominion, but ownership. But then there's also other psalms that say uh, quite the opposite. The heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, referring to the Lord, the, wall, the world and all it contains. And then the Lord speaking, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains and everything that moves in the field is mine. The world is mine and all it contains. Really can't be any doubt of what that means. So I would suggest that uh, the earth being given to men is the authority to rule over it and dominion is what that means. He hasn't given us ownership. So God retains ownership, but he is not a disinterested owner. He is sovereign over creation. He established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. The Lord reigns, and the earth should rejoice. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. So he judges and reigns rightly, and justly with all that he has to deal with. And the Lord reigns, he's clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed and girded himself with strength. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Your throne is established from old. You are from everlasting. So he's girded himself with strength. He's not only the judge, but he has the power to enforce what he has judged. And the world is established therein. There's nothing can, that can upset his judgment and justice or his sovereignty and he is for old from everlasting so he was always was he is now and will be and his justice and always will always be the same so not only is he sovereign over creation but he's not a disinterested judge he also cares for his creation he covers the heavens with clouds and provides rain for the earth he makes the grass to grow on the mountains and the earth is satisfied with the fruit of his works. And all your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord. Now I'd question you this morning. You know, the air you breathe, the food you eat, the water you drink. When was the last time you gave thanks to the Lord for that? You know, are you really thankful that he's given us a wonderful earth to live on? It has everything that we need, and it was perfectly designed for us. But are we thankful, really? Now, God cares for his creation, but let's see what Calvin can do as a, a manager. You know, I think God can take care of the world very well without us. And the interesting thing is that he created us and gave us dominion over creation, and he doesn't need us, and, uh, you, know, you know, actually, what does he need us for? Uh, but he, he did create us. He loved us. He created us. And he gave us the responsibility to manage what he owns. Now, a person who manages something that somebody else owns is called a, a steward. That's right. So we want to look a little bit at what stewardship entails. So what are some of the characteristics of a good steward? Remember the Lord Jesus had a couple parables about stewardship. And from that, we learn that stewards are faithful and sensible, and not just in a few things, in all things. A good steward knows what his master's will is. He doesn't do what he thinks is right himself, but he knows what his master wants, and he does it, even he, if he may not agree with it. He knows his master's will. And then he, knowing his will, he prepares for and performs it. He does his duty. And he's also loyal. He serves only one master. So his uh, interests are not divided. 
So we have a faithful steward. We would say he's trustworthy. A steward is trustworthy for what he's responsible for. He acts responsibly. He does not rely on his own personal judgment, but he acts and represents his master. But the, uh, the, the scripture said he also made him to rule over the works of your hand. So a stewardship also has an element of rulership. So we want to look at the characteristics of a good ruler. And from Proverbs 31, the advice given to King Lemuel was, you don't forget the law. So whereas a good steward remembers his and knows his master's will, here's the reverse of that, don't forget it. And do not pervert justice or oppress the afflicted. In other words, don't use your authority to misapply justice. And you have to be interested in and uh, recognize um, what the consequences of your judgments will be, who the afflicted are and the unafflicted. You also have to judge righteously. And to do that, you have to have a lot of knowledge. You just can't make a decision without knowledge and be judge, judging righteously. So you have to know what you're dealing with. You also have to speak for and represent those appointed to destruction. So those that are helpless, they need an advocate. And you can not only be judged, but you have to be an advocate for those that are appointed to destruction, and you have to plead the cause of the poor and the needy. So characteristics of a good ruler go beyond that of just a judge and justice. Now, we don't really know who King Lemuel was, but I'd like to look at another king, and I want to get the school kids involved again. You studied King Nebuchadnezzar in your Sunday school? Okay, you know a little bit about him. Would you describe him as a good king? Maybe not. Okay. Um, king Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and he's dreaming here of a, a big statue. But he didn't know what the dream meant, so he went to someone from the, the nation of the Jews to get his dream interpreted. And who was that? Daniel. Exactly. And you see Daniel dressed in the white here. He's explaining the meaning of that dream. So King Nebuchadnezzar thought, hey, a big statue, that's a good idea. I'll make one. I'll make everybody bow down and worship it. But there were three Jewish men who refused to worship, and they got, th for punishment, thrown into a, a large fiery furnace. And uh, you see in the furnace how many men? Four. He threw three men in, but he saw a fourth man, which was like the Son of God. I think that was actually the Lord Jesus talking to these three Jewish men that would rather die in a furnace than worship King Nebuchadnezzar's statue. And uh, King Nebuchadnezzar sees it, and he calls these men to come out. And when they came out, they only had second and three degree burns and some <laughs> singeing, right? Were they burned at all? No. no, they didn't even smell like smoke. I imagine King Nebuchadnezzar must have been pretty amazed at that. And then even after these experiences, he has another dream about a large tree that gets cut down. And he goes to Daniel for the interpretation again. Okay. I think God was trying to get his attention. And King Nebuchadnezzar was given advice by Daniel on the interpretation of the dream, which was not really good. And Daniel gave him a warning. Therefore, O king, may, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your posterity. So he was warned and advised to break away from his sins by doing righteousness. Do you think he might have been not been doing righteousness before that? I think he was probably doing unrighteous acts. And from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Remember a good king? He's supposed to be interested in the poor, isn't he? And a good steward looking over the interest of his uh, belongings. But So here we have uh, King Nebuchadnezzar being warned but he didn't take that advice, and just a year later, he was looking over his kingdom saying, look at this great kingdom of, I've made, and what a little good boy am I. And uh, do you remember what happened at that point? Yeah, right. At that point, he says, what, we pre uh, what was prophesied of you happened immediately, and he lost his reason, 
and for how many years lived like a, a cow grazing on grass? Seven. Seven years, okay. For seven years, he had no mind or reason. He just acted like he was a, a dumb cattle grazing on grass. But that period ended. So at the end of seven years, you read in the scripture, at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. My reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, this is one of the more interesting passages of scripture. We have Nebuchadnezzar, who is probably the greatest Gentile king, actually giving a personal word of testimony, and it's recorded in our holy scriptures. I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways just. And he is able to humble those who walk in pride. So I think one of the other lessons we need to learn about being a good steward or a good ruler is that you have to walk humbly before God. It took Nebuchadnezzar seven years of losing his mind to realize that, but at the end he did. And uh, I think from his testimony here, he may actually be in heaven now with his Savior. He'll be an interesting person to meet up there, I think. So Nebuchadnezzar learned the hard way, we might say, that you have to be humble before God. So how about Calvin? Would you say he's humble? Maybe great to be a male and go around banging on things, but that's not necessarily the best thing we can do with our time. We have to use our own judgment and uh, consider more than that. But there's also another example of a good steward in Scripture, and that's of a good shepherd. Now, the prophet Ezekiel, through, with the Lord speaking through him, was talking and actually warning the religious leaders of the Jews at that time that they weren't doing a good job. And he gave some examples of, um, from managing a flock of sheep, what a good job looks like. You have to feed the flock, strengthen the sick, heal the diseased, broken up, bind up the broken, you have to bring back those that are scattered, seek them that are lost. Not only that, managing your flock, but you don't want to ruin their pastures or foul their drinking water because they're going to rely on that or others coming in as well. So the Lord used an example in creation of how a good manager or good steward would watch over a flock. But he was really, really, really referring to the people. God was using this as an illustration, but um, he said, you ought to know this. You ought to know how to manage sheep, and you ought to manage people in the same way or even better. And who's the best example we have in Scripture of a good shepherd? Jesus. The Lord Jesus, that's right. Artists all down through the ages have tried to show pictures of what they think Jesus was a good shepherd was, and this is just an old one there. Okay, so what's the summary of what we've considered so far? Well, we know that God created the heavens and the earth. It didn't just appear out of nowhere, know-how. It wasn't evolved out of nothing. It was a created uh, activity of the Lord. And then he created man. And we learned that man was created in God's own image. And this is a unique thing to us. Even the angels cannot claim that they were created in God's image. And God, even though he doesn't need us or need us to uh, take care of the earth, gave us the right and the authority to subdue and ru rule over the earth and all its creatures. Not only that, but to work and protect the Garden of Eden that he set up for Adam. And then he gave Adam and the animals all the green plants and fruit for food. Nobody ate animals back in those days. Um, but there was one exception to that command, and that was you don't eat of the tree of uh, the knowledge of good and evil. So, when we come to the end of creation, God saw that everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. Up until then, everything he had made was good, but now at the completion of everything with man, everything was very good. So the question we might ask once God had created everything, had Adam in the Garden of Eden, how did Adam 
act as a good steward. What do we know that Adam did? Well, it says, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. Now, if this were me, and the Lord brought a little bunny to me, I'd say, boy, you're really cute. I'm going to call you Fluffy. (laughs) And if he brought a cheetah to me racing across the field, I'd say, wow, you're really fast. I'm going to call you Speedy. I've got maybe two other names now. I'd be the end of it. You know, this is, uh, I think Adam, uh, this was much different for him. I think he really studied these animals, and I think he was our first taxonomist. That means studying the relationship between different animals and giving them names. First taxonomist. And I think this is a big effort. I think Adam was probably a pretty smart guy. But that's all we hear of him. This is all he does. We don't know how he managed his garden or did anything. This is, this is the only activity we hear him doing, he, but he's studying and naming the animals. And then after that, Adam listened to the voice of his wife and everything went to pot. <laughs> right? Evil entered the world because Adam disobeyed that one command that God had given him not to eat of that one tree. And so now God goes from his creative work to his redemptive work. God only got to rest one day on the Sabbath, and then he had to go start redeeming what he had already created. So he had to deal with the consequences and the wreckage of sin. So there was a curse that was placed on creation. Man was expulsed from the Garden of Eden, but there was a promise of redemption. Even at the very beginning, he always knew uh, there would be some redemption of uh, the wreckage and consequences of sin. Uh, theologians refer to this as the Adamic covenant, the covenant with Adam. It doesn't say, I'm taking away dominion from you, but he says, now there's going to be conditions on this dominion. And man's going to rule with a sinful nature. He had a good nature before, didn't he? But he now has a conscience, the knowledge of good and evil, so that he can rule with some judgment. And uh, as one person put it, Before, when Adam was good, he uh, looked at things as good, knowing what evil might be. But when he sinned, then he was evil, and as evil looked and saw what things good might have been. So it's different. But uh, we're under a new condition now. There's uh, elements of the curse. He's going to have to work harder. The uh, ground's going to produce thorns and thistles, as well as the food and Uh, He's going to have a conscience to help guide him. And so Adam and Eve have many children, and the results of this after many generations was, under conscience, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. So here's another question. I'm going to put this one to you, Theo. What was God's next step to deal with man's evil and violence nature? Well, a little bit before that. I'll give you a hint. The Noah's Ark, the big flood. He destroyed all of mankind and all the animals with the exception of what was reserved on the ark. And after the flood, God started afresh with the family of Noah. And he made a covenant with Noah now, like he did with Adam. And he says, I'm never again going to destroy every living thing with a flood. And he also promised that while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So we have a promise from God that this is not going to happen again, at least in a flood, and that all the the seasons that were set up are going to continue till the end of the earth. And all to Noah and his sons, he made a promise, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He made a change. We're not going to eat just plants anymore, but we're going to eat animals. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. And I think as a result of that, all the creatures are going to fear us, aren't they? If we're going to go and kill them, they're going to be afraid of us. And then also he set up a new way of governing man. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. 
for in the image of God he made man. So now I'm just everybody doing what they think is right under their own conscience, which led to evil everywhere. God has given man the ability to judge the actions of other men, and in a case where blood has been shed, the ultimate penalty is that you shed your own blood. And so all human government and human law really entails from this. So now we have a uh, condition of human government, and uh, Noah gave, uh, was given a sign, a rainbow. Remember the rainbow as the sign of the covenant? And the, and the covenant was with Noah and all his descendants, and that includes us. If you remember, Mark was talking Sunday on all, we're all descended from Noah and his family. So the covenant is with all of his descendants, and the duration was to the end of the earth. And so I have not, we still see rainbows in the sky today, right? You've all seen them. So I think that this covenant is still in effect. For all people, this covenant is still binding. He's given us this promise that there's never going to be a flood. And human government is going to manage uh, the affairs of men. So now let's do another summary. In creation, man was given dominion over the earth, and we had all plants for food. Under the Adam's covenant, the dominion was now under sin, conditioned by death, a curse, multiplied labor, and expulsion from paradise. And then under Noah, the dominion continues as it was conditioned, but we have the promise that no further curse will be added, and the seasons and harvest will continue to the end of time, and all animals and plants are now for food. So things have changed from creation, but this is where we are today. Now, what is man's proper response to everything that God has done for us in his grace and mercy? Well, first of all, we have to acknowledge that God created the heavens and the earth. He, and creation declares also his power in Godhead and glory. And we know that he created it in power, wisdom, and understanding. So we acknowledge God created the heavens and the earth. We also have to marvel at the magnitude of his creation, how many of your works there are in wisdom. He made them all. And many are your wonders and thoughts towards us. God wasn't just interested in the earth and the creation and the plants and the animals and all the beauty we have. His thoughts are towards us. And they're not just, I'm thinking for five minutes today about Caleb or I'm going to only have two minutes to give to Benji. He's thinking many thoughts continually about us. And we're also supposed to study and delight in his works. And the psalmist says they are studied or sought out by all who delight in them. He has made his wonders to be remembered. So we're supposed to take a look at this creation and study it. Not just take it for granted, but take a look at it. And the deeper you look, even into um, things as microscopic as cells, you'll find out that they're tremendously complex. And uh, you just have to marvel at the wisdom that God used in creating life out of things that have no life. So I'd like to ask you, um, have you thanked God for his creation? Have you acknowledged or marveled at it lately or studied it? You're doing your birds? Okay, you're going to study that? Okay, good. So we need to be thankful. I'll give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell others of all your wonders. That's man's proper response. But what is what uh, I would call man's natural response? Well, we see that in Romans. Man's natural response was that even though they knew God, they did not glorify or honor him as God or give thanks. Very unthankful refused to glorify or honor him, acknowledge him as God. That's the first step. And it's like a descending staircase. Then they became vain or futile in their imaginations. And being fools, they were professing to be wise. And we see a lot of that in people who are wise, but they really do foolish things. So continuing their downward decline, their downward staircase, 
Then they exchange the truth of God for a lie. Rather than honor him, they would believe a lie. And the glory of the incorruptible God they would exchange for an image in the form of corruptible man, birds, four-footed, and crawling creatures. And at the bottom of the staircase, they worshiped and served the creator, the creator, or rather, the creature or creation rather than the creator. They worshiped and served creation rather than the creator. So I would conclude that the natural man is naturally an environmentalist. He not only, in a sense, loves creation, but he worships it. Now, Christians are never called to worship creation. We're only to worship God. But the natural man is probably more reverent towards creation than Christians are, I would say. They worship creation. Now, when we take a look at God's redemptive work, we also need to look at why Christ came. And what he told us was he came to seek and save that which was lost. He came to call sinners to repentance and to save men's lives. Now, when he was here, he displayed his sovereignty over creation as God. Remember all the miracles he did. He walked on water, healed people, and so forth. He was sovereign over creation, but he never taught us that we're to love creation. And <clears throat> his primary concern was that he would deal with people. Creation was secondary, he might say. And so that was his work. Now, the Christian's priorities are you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says that in Matthew. And in John, he said, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And then... Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, that is the nations, the people, to observe all things I have commanded you. And then Peter would say later on, fear God and honor the king. So the Lord gave us these commands, these priorities, and it doesn't deal with protecting the environment, does it? He doesn't say you've got to go out and plant a tree or do anything like that. He's concerned with people. And he said we should love one another, love your neighbor as yourself. But there's a lot of things implied in that. And Peter would say, fear God and honor the king. So we are to obey the laws of the land. And so these are some of the principles that we would use to make decisions under. Is When we come to make a decision on anything, or even our question on recycling, what do we first consider? Well, is it uh, consistent with loving your neighbor as yourself? And is it consistent with our uh, command to go and make disciples of all nations? And is it consistent with obeying the laws of the land? Now, I was researching this, and I came across some things on the Internet uh, of people who are really interested in preserving the environment, even Christians. And they make it their top priority, at least from what I was reading, and they gave a lot of reasons for that. And I wanted to put out a few here to talk about. One of the ones was that uh, a person said, you know, being out in nature re really makes me feel close to God. And uh, that's how he said he came to, to know God and uh, become a Christian. Now I want to lead others to God by sharing this experience. Now I understand it's hard because, you know, being out in nature is one of the things that I enjoy too. But if he's trying to talk to someone who's not a Christian and say, let's have a, a really nice experience out here and I want to show you what I see, you have to remember that a, the natural man, as we just considered, naturally worships creation. So you're not going to teach him anything new. He's going to be looking at it and say, I don't need your God to have this experience. And so I don't view that as really being something that would save people. Um, they would just look at it and say, I don't need God for this. And so I'm not sure I really agree with this approach. Someone else said, worshiping the creator and caring for creation is all part of loving God. I'm not sure I have a big difference of opinion with this. But you would get into uh, a possible question, is worship and obedience 
really the same thing. So we're not going to pursue that, but I think this is pretty close to uh, someone who uh, loves God and worships the Creator, but also cares for creation as a good steward. I think that's okay. Then I saw this. Christians should be participating in activities that further Christ's reconciliation of all creation to God. We should be doing things that further Christ's reconciliation of all creation to God. Now, when we consider how God made the heavens and the earth, I don't think we were involved in that at all. We weren't even around. God didn't need our help to create the earth. And when he redeemed us, as Thea mentioned, by dying on the cross, that was when he reconciled all things to himself and to God. And we weren't involved with that either, other than bringing our sin to him and forcing him to have to do that. So I would say, I'm not sure what this person is thinking. You know, we're not, by our own works, reconciling anything or helping God. People have tried to picture what the millennium might be like, the lion lying down with the lamb and so forth. You know, we're not going to be able to do wildlife management and create that type of situation. That's all going to be the work of the Lord. And yes, we need to be good stewards of what he's given us because that is how we get our food and we care for other people through the environment and how we manage it. And we can do a bad thing with that. But we're not going to help him reconcile anything. And so I have two cautions. First of all, another quote that I like was a reverence and respect for nature and God's created world has shifted and become the latest idol for Christians. So instead of remembering that we should be saving people, we think we're going to save the environment and that, that'll help things out. Uh, we don't need to make something an idol more than serving the Lord and what he's commanded us to do. Then even more interesting to me is what the Lord said to uh, the scribes and Pharisees. Woe to you, he said, hypocrites. You tithe mint and dill and cumin, which are very minor things, and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. So he said, you were not doing a wrong thing by tithing all these th small items, which was the smaller provision of the law, but you're forgetting to do the major ones. So they, as someone put it, they're majoring on the minor and minoring on the major. You have to keep your priorities straight. The Pharisees and the scribes really didn't have that, and the Lord's it's not saying that taking care of the earth is wrong. We have that command. But it's not the most important thing. So we have to keep that in mind. What are our priorities? So now we're in a position where we can answer, I think, the question, should a Christian recycle? Well, the US EPA lists a number of benefits of recycling. And they all sound very good. And at the bottom there, you'll see it uh, has an economic benefit, creating jobs and, and so forth. And we would take a look at some of these reasons and we would then apply some of our principles. And uh, first of all, does it obey the laws of the land? A lot of our communities require recycling, or at least they make it a part of the trash collection. So in that case, yes, you should recycle. And if you can uh, reduce the landfills and uh, reduce the amount of, say, mining or lumbering or anything that produces these uh, items that we want to recycle from the raw materials, then you're protecting the land. You may actually be preventing pollution and uh, doing a good thing, which is all part of loving your neighbor. So I, I would say, yes, a Christian should recycle. I think it makes sense for anybody to recycle. Christians have no different reason other, but we do have a scriptural basis for now, knowing that we have to be good stewards and recycling or whatever that entails. So, should a Christian recycle? I think so, yes, there's no real problem with that, but I think there's a better answer. Better than recycling, don't buy what you don't need. I mean, that's not the only question we need to ask. Um, you know, you'll never miss the water till the well runs dry, that was an old phrase. You know, you can leave the faucet running and think everything's great, you're wasting water, but then when that water runs out, 
and you can't turn your faucet on anymore, then you know that the wells run dry. It was too late, too late to do anything. So you want to do things to conserve your resources. But a lot of people just keep buying what they uh, don't need, and then they throw it away. And if recycling makes you feel better about that, maybe that's not the best answer. So um, it's an interesting question, and I hope I haven't raised too many more questions in, in this. But um, you know, it's one of these things that Scripture doesn't really answer directly, but I think um, it leads to other questions and maybe uh, questions on how can we be better stewards, maybe recycling or something better than we are should be doing there. So um, we'll conclude there. Jerry, I'd like to ask you to come up and lead us in a hymn. Hymn 56, please. Beverly, if you wouldn't mind.